Hi, whether you're a first time YouTube guest or a long time member of our church, First Baptist Pulaski welcomes you. You know, our church family is messy. We are flawed. We have issues. We have sinned and fallen way short of what God desires and requires. But much of what motivates our worship is gratitude. See, God didn't leave us hopelessly wallowing around in the mud of our sin. No, He saw our need to be clean and sent His Son Jesus to take on human flesh, live the perfect life we could not, offer Himself on a cross as payment for our sins, and then rise victoriously from the dead. As Psalm 40 suggests, God lifted us up from the muck and mire, set our feet firmly on the rock of His Son, and put a new song of praise in our mouths. The truth is, we here at First Baptist Pulaski are imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We hope the encounter you are about to have with Him puts a new song of praise in your mouth as well. And if you find yourself in our neck of the woods anytime soon, we would love to have you come worship, grow, and serve with us in person. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, at this time, we turn our attention to our call to worship. And uh, as you can see, it is the Lord's Supper. And so I thought it'd be appropriate for it to come from Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 6. It says this, Who has believed that he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root from a dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he is pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with, words, with his words we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, each one of us, to their own way. And yet the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come here today to celebrate what you have done for us, Lord, it comes also with a heaviness to understand of just what sort of payment was required. The fact that your son, Jesus Christ, had to die for our sins, to be broken and beaten. Lord, to be tortured and hung on a cross. Lord, but what victory comes with the blood of your son, Jesus? That he didn't stay buried in a tomb, but rose from the dead on the third day, victorious over death and hell. Lord, giving us the opportunity to have a relationship with you. Lord God, I thank you that we can place our trust in Jesus Christ, that we can turn to you in repentance and in faith, and Lord, have the grace and mercy that comes from a loving God. Lord, we celebrate you today. We celebrate Jesus today. We celebrate every day. Help us to live our lives in worship. Bless our time together, and may the Holy Spirit move in a mighty way today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing, Even If.
with our soul does not mean it's well with our circumstances any more than it meant it was well with the circumstances of three Hebrew boys. Young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We read in Daniel chapter 3, you don't need to turn there, King Nebuchadnezzar saying to them, now if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the drum, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the statue that I made. But if you don't worship it, you will immediately be thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that can rescue you from my power? We're being asked that by the prince of this age. Who is the God that can rescue from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods 
or worship the gold statue you set up. So that's what we're being asked today. We're being asked in the face of our, our trials, our temptations, our struggles, our pains, are we going to submit and give in and shut down and walk away from the God who offers us eternal life in his son? Are we going to say even if? I have all the evidence I need of his love for us, of his love for me. I'm going to trust him. Because we're putting on display for the world the hope of Christ in the middle of our pain. Yes, sin and death and crying and mourning and the old order of things will pass away, but it hasn't yet. So we testify. And we say it is well with my soul, even though it's not well with my circumstances. Do you know that? That's part of what today is about, a special time of remembrance. We, we've had a number of, of folks that are new to the church family from other faith traditions, other denominations within Christianity, not, not other religions, but other denominations within Christianity ask, why do you, when do you do the Lord's Supper? Why do you do it the way you do it? Part of the reason that we do it the way we do it is, is so that it doesn't lose its sense of being somehow special, that, that we're called in a special way to remember the life and the death, the resurrection, the sacrifice of Christ, his obedience, because we are not. And that's why we do it. There, there are good reasons to do it every week. There are good reasons to do it more infrequently than we do it. But this is where we are. About every other month is kind of how we, how we work. And again, today is a special day of remembrance for us. We turn our attention to the person of Christ in a, in a very special way. His life, his death, his resurrection. This Jesus that we've been singing about already that we're remembering today the one who is both fully God and fully man, the bread, he took on our flesh. The cup, he emptied himself of his full life in obedience to God. He is the ground, the foundation, the center of our faith, our hope of eternal life, of our purpose, of our unity, and we could go on and on. Life is full of trials and disappointments. But we're not unique in this. I want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. We'll see that our Lord dealt with a number of these stresses and trials and disappointments as well. If you're new to us, that page numbered, that number 781 under there is if the Bible is shorter than the hymnal in your pew rack there, that's a page you're on, 781, or 1115 if it's about the same height, the large print Bibles. Again, since Adam and Eve chose to rebel and sin entered the world through one man, Adam, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all, as Brother Aaron read from, from God's word in Isaiah 53, we've all turned to our own way. And there's been struggle. There's disease. There's famine. There's sickness. There's death. There's relational friction. There's strife. There's loss. There's on and on we could go. But again, Jesus entered into our suffering as we'll see in clearer relief today. Verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, since Christ suffered in the flesh, I don't know where your mind went to when you read that. Christ suffered in the flesh. Maybe the cross. Maybe, maybe, I don't know where it went to. But the New Testament gives us a number of different accounts of how Jesus suffered. He suffered persecution as a child. 
After they were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, this is talking about the, the wise men, as we would call them, get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So, from his earliest days, he's being hounded to be killed. Of course, we know how the Lord dealt with that, but can you imagine picking up your newborn and running to another country just so your newborn would be alive? Because someone was out to kill your child? So Jesus suffered persecution as a child. He suffered misunderstanding and rejection by his family. His brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea so your disciples can see your works that you're doing. No one does anything in secret while he's seeking public recognition. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Not even his brothers believed in him. I mean, as a pastor, I have the privilege, and I say that sincerely, the privilege of talking to people in our church family and in our community who grew up with a lot of mess and how that warps us all, how that shapes us and, and makes things difficult for us. Can you imagine growing up having been hounded, your family not even understanding or accepting you? Some of you can relate to this. You don't feel like your, your family really accepts you or understands you. The feeling of being on the outside of the group of people that you should be in the right, right in the middle of, the inside of, and that was Jesus' life, too. Again, I think a lot of our, our minds probably went straight to the cross as it relates to Jesus' suffering. <laughs> but that's not the full story. That, that's, that, that was not the arc of his life. The arc of his life was suffering from his earliest days. And by the way, in this world, if we're representing the holy living God, why would we expect ours to be any different? We have this American idea of Christianity at times that says, you know, if, if, if I'm rightly related to God, then things will be smooth. Well, actually, it's probably the opposite of that. In this life, you will have trouble, the Lord says. You're going to have friction. They're going to not understand or like or agree with you. Jesus suffered rejection, misunderstanding by his family. Later, his followers, his disciples, do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? Do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of pieces of bread did you collect? Twelve, they told him. Well, what's he saying? Well, what does that mean? Hello. I'm the son of God. If I have power over this physical world, if I can take loaves and fish that you could put in two hands and feed 5,000 people or more, what does that say about who I am? What does that say to you, my disciples, my students, my followers? Hello. But he's also saying to us, if I have that power, what does that say to you in your circumstances? If I rose from the dead, what does that say to you? If I walked on water, what does that say to you? If I ascended to heaven, what does that say to you about who I am? He was misunderstood by his disciples. He suffered the unbelief of his own people. He replied to them, you unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long must I put up with it? Can you imagine the grind? Sometimes as parents or teachers or coaches or friends even, whatever, uh, boyfriends, spouses, whatever, girlfriends, you, you, you think, what is it going to take for me to convince you that I really care? That like, my love is imperfect for you as a human being, but I really do love you. I really do care. And no, no, you don't, no, you don't, no, you don't, no, you don't, no, you don't. We can, we can sort of relate to that a little bit. I'm saying what I'm saying from love. And, and Jesus is over and over and over and over and over again. If you read the gospel accounts over and over and over and over again, he's reminding them of who he is, uh, of his love, of truth, 
And they're rejecting, 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 rejecting. And he says, how long must I do this? He suffered the unbelief of his people. He suffered the scheming of the religious leaders. The Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Again, think about his life. The entirety of his life was struggle. And think about what is his motivation? Why is he doing this? He suffered the anguish of the lostness of his own people. As he's coming into Jerusalem, as he approached and saw the city, he wept over it. They were like sheep without a shepherd. He wept over the city, the center of worship still to this day. By the way, unashamed plug, meeting in two weeks to make some initial payments for our Holy Land tour. So this is going to be quite the pilgrimage for many of us. If you have interest in going, we'd love to have you. But you think as you're standing there, on the Mount of Olives, looking across the Kidron Valley, looking at where the Temple Mount is, those walls, and you think, right here, Jesus came from Bethany, up over this little hill, and this is what he saw, this this town, not like looking like it does, obviously, but right here is where Jesus was weeping, over his people, because he wanted his people to receive him in faith, and they did not. Jesus suffered betrayal and abandonment by his friends. We'll pick one, Judas. Jesus replied, the one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. Then Judas, the betrayer, replied, surely not I, Rabbi. You have said it, he told him. Rejected by his friends. Abandoned. We know Peter left him. Peter denied him all these sorts of things. But Judas betrayed him to the Romans, to the Jewish leadership. He was mocked by the Romans. The governor's soldiers stripped him, twisted together crowns of thorns, put it on his head and placed a reed in his right hand. They knelt down before him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews. Then they spit on him, took the reed and kept hitting him on the head. Christ suffered in the flesh. Not not just his body at the crucifixion. While he was human, he was suffering. The anger of his people shortly after this trial. Pilate asked them, what should I do then with this Jesus who is called the Messiah? They answered, crucify him. And he said, why? What has he done wrong? And they kept shouting, crucify him all the more. so unjust, it's so agonizing to think about. Just the constant grind of pressure and rejection and misunderstanding and alienation that he went through. Why? Why did he do it? Of course, the crucifixion. They arrived at the place called the Skull. They crucified him there along with the criminals. One on the right, one on the left. He was identified with the criminals, the lawbreakers, when he wasn't. Of course, we know the the account, both those criminals, these thieves, are mocking him, and then one has a change of heart and says, be quiet. He's done nothing wrong. He's not like us. That's right. That's right. And arguably... The greatest thing Christ suffered in it all, in his humanity, on the cross, Matthew 27, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In his humanity, that he would have that sense that he was completely alone in the universe. His mother there, his 
disciples there, the mocking Romans, the, his people there, and now the constant that he knew of the love of God in his humanity, struggling with feeling that he was abandoned in his humanity. We believe as Christians that in an eternity past the, the, that God existed as Father, Son, and Spirit, that Jesus took on our flesh. He wasn't born as a man and, and became adopted uh, as the Son of God. That's Mormonism and other religions, by the way. Adoptionism. We don't believe in that. We believe that Jesus existed before, eterni- before anything was made that was made, before the angels, before the stars, before the universe was made. God existed as Father, Son, and Spirit. So in, his enti- in the entirety of his existence, he had known intimacy with the Heavenly Father. That had been his bedrock. The Holy Spirit ministered to him in the wilderness. The Holy Spirit was with him even in the garden, you know, encouraging him. Presence of angels, whatever. And now, my God, why have you forsaken me? Brother Aaron read that passage from Isaiah 53. How about one verse from there? He was despised, rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh. 1 Peter 4, verse 1 goes on, equip yourselves also with the same resolve. Equip yourselves with the same resolve. Christian, child of God, Jesus suffered his entire life. Equip yourself with the same resolve. Some of our translations here talk and use language that that helps us understand arm yourselves. Because this is what's called in, in Bible study land a hapax legomena. And it's one, a, a, a word that comes one time in the Bible. It's, this, is, this word is only used one time in the Bible right here. Equip yourselves. And it's a word that's used of soldiers getting ready for battle. The tense that it's used is, it, it's, a, it's a summary tense that's saying... This should be the condition. This this should be who you are, that you're armed for battle. Because in this world, you will struggle. You will hurt. You will have pain. Why? For the same reason he did. For the glory of God and for the good of someone else. So that someone else in his or her pain can see the truth of Christ, even if... Nebuchadnezzar, even if, right there. This is sort of a summary statement for life in in this world, for all believers. Arm yourselves, equip yourselves with the same resolve, because the one who suffered in the flesh has finished with sin. He, He completed the work the Father gave him to do. He said from the cross, it is finished. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for humans, for human desires, but for God's will. No longer for human desires. Some of your translations say lusts. Some of this emphasis is on us craving things of this world, the lusts associated with this world. So, Christian, what's holding you back? from being the person you need to be, from doing what you need to do. Equip yourselves with the same resolve. It's an imperative. Do this. Again, Christ suffered in the flesh. Equip yourselves with the same resolve. 1 John 2.16 talks about the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, the pride in one's life, everything belongs, that belongs to the world, the lusts of the flesh, our cravings, our lusts. 
the lust of the eyes, our covetousness, wanting things we don't have. Wanting something that we know is not ours. A job. Someone else's boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse. Money that we didn't earn. Whatever it is. Lust of the eyes. And the pride in one's lifestyle is the way that the Holman translates this. It has to do with our self-centeredness, basically. That we want things on our terms, our way. The pride of life. It's not from the Father, that's from this world. Equip yourselves with the same mind as Christ had. Get away from that. Romans 6, verses 6 and 7. We know that our old self was crucified with him, Christian, in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished. We have resurrection power over sin right now. The Holy Spirit ministers that to and through us so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin since a person who has died is free from sin's claims. If we've been identified with Christ in his death, his burial, his resurrection, sin no longer has mastery over us. So why are we making excuses for ourselves? That's what we're being called to consider today. No longer for human desires, but for God's will. God's will, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, Romans 12, 2. That which silences the ignorance of the foolish, 1 Peter 2, 15. It silences the ignorant talk of foolish men, some translations say. God's will is that we abstain from sexual immorality, controlling our own bodies, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 5. God's will is that we not be drunk, Ephesians 5, 18. God's will is that we do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly before our God, Micah 6, 8. God's will is that all would come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. 1 Timothy 2.4, 2 Peter 3.9. God's will, non-Christian, if you haven't taken that step yet, is that you would look on the Son, believe in Him, and have eternal life. John 6.40. But for those who embrace Christ, Jesus said, in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of the Father and finish his work. Can we say that? If you claim the name of Christ, can you say that? My will is to, my food is to do the will of the Father and finish the work he's given me to do. That's what today is about. Equip yourselves with the same resolve. Purpose yourselves with the same commitment. In the face of trials, hang in there. Persevere, reorient yourself to the suffering of Christ and do likewise. Look at verses 3 and 4 in our passage. There's already been enough time spent in doing what the pagans choose to do, carrying on an unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, lawless idolatry. So they are surprised that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of wild living. Such a great translation there. We're just carried away. We're swept away into this fleshly kind of living. And they slander you. They make fun of you. They talk down about you because you are not doing what they do. They mock that which they don't understand. The world demeans us now. The world mocks us now. But a time is coming where this won't be so. The world will give an account. Non-Christian, for you, what is keeping you from receiving Christ for the forgiveness of your sin? What is keeping you from trusting in this Jesus that maybe you've mocked? Embracing the faith of those who you quietly respect but you've derided publicly. What's keeping you from the, receiving the free gift of God in Christ. Verse 5 says, They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. It's pretty powerful. Verse 6, For this reason the gospel was preached to those who are now dead. I don't take that to mean when Christ descended 
he preached to those who were in purgatory. I don't understand that to be the case in this particular passage or any, honestly, but certainly not here. What this is talking about, as I understand, is those who are spiritually dead. He's preaching to, to people who are rejecting him, calling us to faith to come out of our death to life. He was doing it then, and that's what I'm doing right now. That's what we are all to be doing in our daily, weekly lives, to be preaching this. This reason the gospel is preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged by men in the fleshly realm, this is kind of a, this is kind of a tricky phrase here, judged by men in the fleshly realm. It, the two best options here are judged by other people while we're alive, versus being judged by God, or this means that, that we're, the judgment sentence for us outside of Christ in this life is already death. It's, it's complicated. We're going to skip over that. But the point here to the non-Christian, again, is John 6, 40. This is the will of my Father. Everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. Have you done that? Will you do that? He's calling you through the suffering of his son to do that. We're remembering him in a special way today, as we've said. And we take this bread and we take this cup and we remember the life of Christ, the body, the incarnation, the blood that he shed for the forgiveness of our sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is probably the, the central passage that gives us orientation to this remembrance of the Lord's Supper. Just a couple of things from this passage. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're doing. We're saying by participating in this, I believe that Jesus suffered and died for me. I believe that he rose from the dead for me. This is an expression of faith. And the Lord is inviting you to believe that and join in this celebration with us. If you've never done that, please do that today. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, meaning not associated with faith is the way I take it, primarily, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. We're, we're proclaiming our faith by participating in this Lord's Supper. That's what we're doing. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. You're, you're adding to your, to your sin. It's interesting, though, too, in context in 1 Corinthians, there's a lot of disunity in, in 1 Corinthians within the church. So part of what's being said here about the body of Christ, we are the body of Christ. So if we're ignoring the friction and division and all these, the anger, the bitterness that we have against one another, we're missing the point too. We're eating and drinking judgment on ourselves if we're not dealing with our sin against each other. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 from the ESV reminds us, for all the promises of God find their yes in him. That's why it is through him we utter our amen to God for his glory. The worship team is going to come up now and help us with this next song. It's a very exalting song that reminds us that all God's promises are yes in Christ. If we've received Christ for the forgiveness of our sin, if we are people of faith in this Jesus, all these promises are yes. This is why we sing. I'm going to tease this out right now, but after this song and then an offertory prayer, we're going to have a time of reflection uh, as Miss Beth plays moving into our Lord's Supper time. The altar will be open, so this song and then the deacon, uh, the deacon of the week is going to pray and uh, share with us, and then the altar will be open. If you would like to come and pray, to get right, maybe grab the hand of someone you need to get right with, come to the altar and pray. Uh, if you'd like to announce a decision to the church, we'd love to hear it, your desire to to become a Christian or to be baptized or 
uh, whatever you need to get right or get off your heart, we'd love to hear it. Could we invite you to stand, please, and, and join in to worship as you're able? Oh, praise the name. Father, we do sing your praises, Lord. Today, right now, we come with hearts filled with thanksgiving for the gift of your salvation, for you sending your Son. 
And as we return now, the material gifts that you've given us, Lord, let us remember that you were, in fact, the author of all of them, that you gave them to us, and all we're doing is honoring you when we give them back. So, Lord, accept, I ask, these gifts, these tithes, to be used for your work, and we ask this in your Son's most precious name. Amen. Well, as the deacons are finishing up with the, the offering, I would remind anyone who is new to our church family about how we do the Lord's Supper here. We've talked a little bit about why we do the Lord's Supper here. We're remembering the life, the suffering, the willing suffering of the Lamb of God, the innocent Son of God. And by taking these elements, that's what we're saying, is that we believe that he became one of us, that he suffered. Why did he do it? Yes, for the glory of God, the obedience that he was offering in his life to his heavenly Father. But if you missed it, he did what he did. He suffered for you in love. He suffered for me in love. Why did he do it? Out of love for his Father and for you and me. That's why he did it. Father, as we come to this time of remembering you, we give you thanks for the way that you gave the supreme sacrifice. Thank you, Father, for loving us. And help us, Father, to try to love you the way that you do love us. As we remember you today, we ask your blessings as we try to praise and worship you through what we do. Help us to live each day in a way that would please you. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. bread, we remember the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. Heavenly Father, in your word, you tell us without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. And because of that, you gave us the gift of your Son and allowed his blood to be shed for us. Today, we remember that, Lord, and ask you to bless this moment. Amen. As Dr. Beasley helps the choir get the 
the elements here. The words from Hebrews chapter 12, let us lay aside every weight, the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that laid before him endured a cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. In struggling against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. But he has. He did. He shed his blood to pay for sin that we committed that he did not. And because of this, we worship, we remember. Amen. We would invite you to stand if you're able. And we're going to dismiss each other with um, this last song. As I was sitting here thinking about this this last song coming up, I was reminded of, some of you may know the, the singer, the Christian singer. He's of the Catholic tradition, Michael Card. He has a song called Poema, and in that song it says, Life is a song that we sing with our days, a poem of meaning more than words can say. We are about to leave here, those of us who name the name of Christ, whether it's to our Sunday school classes or somewhere else, and we're going to sing a song with our lives. And we trust that in the grace of God, the work of the Spirit in and through us, that our song reminds someone of Christ. We're going to sing this story with our lives. So keep that in mind as we sing this last song. We're going to sing verses 1 and 2 and then a chorus, and then 4 and 5 and then a chorus. So it's a little different than you're used to. But here we go. Peace.